Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us on another episode of the All Might Be Edified Discussions on Servant Leadership. I'm Keith Pankow, and I have the amazing opportunity to be here with Frank Cespedes. Frank is a Harvard Business School professor and a former managing partner at a professional services firm. He's a renowned expert in leadership, strategy, and sales, the author of six books, including Aligning Strategy and Sales and Sales Management That Works. He's a board member on several organizations' boards. He has a PhD from Cornell University and a master's degree from MIT. Well, Frank, so excited to talk to you today on the podcast. Welcome. Keith, thank you very much. It is truly my pleasure to be here. Thank you. Oh, I, I'm just so excited. Well, Frank, all of us might have a different definition of leadership. And, you know, we talk a lot about servant leadership on this podcast, and that can take on many forms as well of definitions. What's your definition of leadership? Well, my definition of leadership is not that fancy, but I think servant leadership, which, as you know, has become a bit of a buzzword over the last two decades. But what I think people mean by servant leadership is fundamentally synonymous with what I mean by leadership. Leadership, whatever else it is, is the ability to get things done through others. And if you can't do that in any organization, you're only as good as your own arms can reach. So leadership is that ability to extend, in effect, the ability of uh, your influence and get things done through others. And I think that's fundamentally what servant leadership is about. It's about helping others get the right things done. I also think it's important to define what a leader is as well as leadership. And I think there's, again, been a lot of mystification about that term in the last two decades. You know, a leader is someone who is charismatic, transformational, separated at birth from Steve Jobs or something like that. <laughs> By a leader, I mean someone who can materially affect the allocation of resources in an organization. And when you think about leaders that way, it's not just the people at the top. It's people throughout many other parts of the organization who do affect where the organization spends its time, money, talent, and whether or not they get things done through others. So those are my definitions of those crucial terms. I really like that. And it's so important to understand what those definitions are and to create that understanding when we're talking to different people, because then we can create that common language and understanding moving forward. And I really like the way you used resources. And, you know, I've worked with a lot of people and they talk about people are our most important resources, but then their actions or the other way they prioritize things don't always speak to that. And then they'll use terms like servant leadership. And when they their actions don't mimic the behavior that people are their most important resources, and they use phrase like servant leadership that can cause harm to their messaging. And I wonder when you write a lot about sales, and we'll talk about your book here in a moment, your most recent book and some of your other writings, but when your messaging doesn't mirror your actions, what does that do to the people within your organization? I think the result of that is pretty clear. It breeds cynicism, distrust, alienation, as uh, people say. And, and this is, you know, particularly important in the area that uh, your podcast focuses on. In my experience, and, and my experience here is, is pretty good, Keith, you know, we're, we're only doing the audio, but if your audience could see me, uh, they would see the, uh, uh, the balding spots. I've, I've sort of been around the block for some years. And I have never come across an organization that says people, we don't care about people. I mean, that rhetoric is pervasive and easy, but you're exactly right. You either walk the talk, as they say, or you don't. And uh, people are very, very good, not just in the political realm, but in the organizational realm of understanding where words and reality mesh and where they don't. There is an old HR aphorism. It's been around for generations, and it's true. People join companies, but they leave managers. You understand what they're getting? People join companies. Hey, you're doing interesting stuff. This is cool. I love what you do uh, for society, but they leave managers. In other words, they leave those who manage the people in the organization. Yeah, I think that's so true. And 
we talked a lot about on some previous episodes that during the pandemic, when we saw a lot of people leave their jobs in, in mass exodus, or and then we talk a lot more in a lot of different circles about quiet quitting, that really what we're seeing is a large scale leadership failure. And I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. I mean, I would point out two things. My understanding of the data, and I don't think this uh, gets emphasized enough. If you look at the data about so-called employee engagement, you know, as you know, the Gallup organization and others have been doing a pretty darn good uh, survey research about this for, for decades. Employee engagement in most organizations was nothing to brag about even before the pandemic. Percentages were relatively low and they were declining. So, you know, the phenomenon of quiet quitting, which is a lack of engagement, was not new. I think the results during the pandemic, however, are confounded. I don't think that uh, quiet quitting was simply resignation. Again, we have that trend for some time. A lot of that was organizations that were making decisions about talent. And I think we need to recognize that. But the default, the deficit in leadership was not simply something induced by the pandemic or post-pandemic conditions. It's been an issue for some time, and that should not surprise us, because this aspect of organizations is not new, and it will not change whether or not chat GPT becomes, you know, as common as the telephone. It is built in to the way we as human beings do or don't work together productively in an organization. Yeah, that's so wonderful. I love that thought that these aren't new issues, that this has been ongoing. And, you know, you talk a lot about sales and there's a propensity in a lot of people to just trust salesmanship and salespersons. And I think that there's a way to create good products that are marketed in a good way with strong ethics to create, you know, this company that does well and continues to provide good things. And we see that, you know, when I was working on my master's degree in organizational leadership, we saw these examples of companies that would create amazing products and then they would bring teams together to say, how do we keep this momentum going for longevity? And it's amazing when they do the right things for the right reasons, their sales continue to go beyond and beyond and beyond. And I think there's some applicability in servant leadership there for not just how you serve the people in your organization, but how you serve the customers as well. And talk to us a little bit about your book and how you approached your book, you know, focusing on aligning strategy and sales. And then we'll kind of go from there about how it serves the customers and the employees in the businesses. Well, I mean, I had basically two motivations in writing my most recent book. The first one is fundamentally a professional intellectual motivation. I'm going to use a little jargon, but I hope that's okay with our listeners. Of all the various activities in the so-called value chain, value chain is essentially business school jargon for talking about all the activities that any organization must engage in. You've got to source materials or information. You have to process it and presumably add value. And then you have to sell and service it in the marketplace. Of all those activities, sales is by far the most context specific. And that's why generalizations about sales are dangerous. I mean, no one likes to be, quote, sold, but sales is very context specific. Selling software is different than selling capital goods, is different than selling professional services, etc. Selling in the United States is different than selling in Latin America or Asia or the Middle East. And yet, for some reason, sales is that aspect of business where people love to engage in these huge generalizations that are usually unsupported by any data whatsoever beyond what in academia we call N equals one. When I sold for so-and-so, this is what worked for me, and I'm sure it'll work for you. So, you know, after 30 years of doing what I think is pretty good research in this area, I wanted to write a book. This is what research does and does not tell you 
about this core activity in business. And the second motivation is I think it's a particularly good time for a book like that. There is no doubt, no doubt whatsoever, that uh, the digital technology revolution, which will continue throughout our lifetimes, there is no doubt that it's affecting buying and selling. But again, my reading of what people say about that is that they simply misunderstand not only the data, they misunderstand the managerial and human implications of what is going on. It is not a digital eats physical world. The data does not support those generalizations, but it is a very, very different buying world. And the most important thing about selling in any business is the buyer. Who buys why and how, not the seller. So that's what's uh, behind uh, writing yet another book about sales. Well, I love it. I think there's some powerful themes of servant leadership in there to recognize that you know, the buyers are quite different depending on what you're selling, the industry that you're in, the different organizations you're working in, the different countries you're working in. You know, I've got quite a bit of international experience and you're right, the different countries, the different cultures that you're working in. I was talking to my brother who works for Boeing and was working with some executives in Japan and just recognizing not only the, the products that you work, but when you work with different cultures, if you make a misstep in communications, you can mess up that whole selling process. So that N equals yeah. one can have profound implications if you're not paying attention to some of those things. So no, I agree. And the way I tend to phrase uh, the point you're making, and you know, once you say these kinds of things, they sound pretty obvious, but I assure you, I get around and a lot of smart, senior, well-paid and well-educated people forget this. It is not the buyer's responsibility to educate you and tell you when you are barking up the wrong tree. In business, it is your responsibility to figure that out. Yeah, I really love that. And I sometimes think that some of our cultural biases in the United States hurt us. A lot of times we hear things like, you know, we only train towards English in our country. And there's many times where other countries speak three languages. And so they're taught different cultures from an early age. And so they have these propensities towards learning language, learning other cultures. One of my professions I learned is that, you know, other countries have an outward facing culture just automatically towards the United States because they watch a lot of our Hollywood and we don't watch naturally a lot of international media or listen to a lot of international music. And so we naturally have this inward facing thought process that we don't even recognize as a bias. And so when we move into sales in an international market, you know, we might not even recognize that just the way we were brought up might limit the way we see the world. And, you know, like you said, people think intellectually, they understand some of these concepts, but these limiting factors might influence the way they approach the other people they see. And the buyers, they can go to any market they want. They don't have to choose your product. I think what you're saying is fundamentally true. But I, I would only add the following. One is, I think that bias exists not just in the United States. You know, in the United States, we like to say that uh, we're the only people in the world that are arrogant, biased, etc. That itself is a form of arrogance, you know, what people call exceptionalism. The ability to uh, navel gaze, uh, you know, the Lord spread that around pretty equally. Second, we, however, benefit in a way that just virtually most other countries do not, uh, for reasons, for historical reasons, having to do with the British before us and trade. English has, you know, became in the 20th century the sort of lingua franca of business. And for that reason, if you're in France or Germany or China, if you're going to pick a foreign language, you know which one they pick most often. It's English for us. It's a different issue. It's a, a bigger challenge. Um, that said, at the end of the day, sales in particular is much more culturally determined, let's say, than manufacturing or product development. And for that reason, you still must understand who you're buying. And that buying process is not only about, you know, the features of the product or service. It is also about how people buy. And that's, once again, where culture is important, national culture, as well as organizational culture. I love that. And I love how you 
reminded us that that exceptionalism is a very real thing and another form of bias because we do get caught in that thinking, you know, as, as another form of bias. And I really appreciate that. You know, one of the things as we look at things like that, these biases that we're, we have so many forms of data today and all of this research that your book's talking about aligning strategy and sales and how we do that better. How do we use the data that's available to us, these new AI tools that are coming on board, you know, there's ways to create guardrails, if you will, to create better methodologies, better practices. I think a lot of people are afraid of the technology. They're afraid of how do we harness big data? How do we harness AI? How do we move forward in a way that allows us to make better informed decisions with the right data sources and the right technology? Here, I'd say a few things. I mean, we are, as I said uh, earlier, Keith, we're living through a data revolution, but we have been for quite some time. One of the very, very best things written about this topic was written in the mid-1960s. Now, that's a long time ago by Peter Drucker. I, I don't know how many of our listeners remember Peter Drucker, but Peter Drucker was probably the uh, preeminent management guru of the 20th century, and deservedly so. Drucker was very, very smart. His books are an absolute model of how to talk about important management and leadership issues in jargon-free English, and they're full of insights. Drucker wrote an essay, I think it was in 1965, and the title of the essay was The Manager and the Moron. The moron was the computer. And Drucker's point is that the computer generates data. It generates answers to questions. And that remains true 70 years later, even with chat GPT. But the manager is the one who has to interpret whatever the data is and use that for decision-making resource allocation purposes. And even though obviously, and we all know that if uh, the computer in 1965 were the computer in 2023, it would be you know, the difference between a Rolls Royce and, and something small. But even despite that exponential growth, Drucker's basic point remains, right? So that's comment number one. Comment number two is we are drowning in data, but that is ultimately a managerial issue. It is not a technology issue. The responsibility of people in organizations and their ability to get them things done through others servant leadership depends on understanding what is the important stuff in our business, the really relevant data, and what is a set of interesting but marginal factoids. And again, I don't think that's something that a machine, no matter how powerful, can do. It depends on an understanding of our business, our market, the specifics here. So that's that's number two. And then the third thing I would say, and I think I can talk about this with some credibility, I'm on the boards of two companies where we sell artificial intelligence tools, uh, in one case for sales and another case for another function. But at the end of the day, what we mean by artificial intelligence is machine learning. And machine learning is built on correlations and the ability to generate one hopes more and better correlations as you get more data. But again, we all know this phrase, correlation is not causation, and teasing out the two is not something chat GPT does, right? We already talk about hallucinations. It's something people need to do in the ongoing river that we call business. Uh, some great thoughts there. One of the things that you do a really good job is educating C-suite executives. And we talked a little bit earlier as we were preparing to go live on this episode about the growing gap between the C-suite and everybody in the business and the knowledge they need to run the company. And that kind of corresponds a little bit to the massive amounts of big data and you know what they do with it in that managerial issue of consolidating finding the causations within those correlations and how they can better run their company to a degree. So what advice do you have 
to these C-suite executives to close those knowledge gaps within their organizations? Well, first, I think it's important to understand first the reality of that gap and what causes it. You know, then we can get to recommendations. There's been a big, big change in the composition of the C-suite in organizations around the world. And I'm assuming our listeners know that jargon. C-suite refers to what we simply used to call the senior leadership team, CEO, COO, CFO, etc. What the research indicates is that over the last 25 years or so, the number of executives reporting to the CEO in the global 1,000, that is the 1,000 biggest organizations, companies in the world, the number of executives reporting to the CEO has on average doubled twice as many. But then if you step back and ask yourself, who are these people? What were they doing before they became senior executives? The reality is that actually very few of them were general managers in the way we use that phrase, at least at Harvard Business School. At Harvard, when we refer to a general manager, we're generally referring to somebody who runs a line of business or has cross-functional profit and loss responsibility. Most of these additions to the C-suite have been specialists, the CIO, the head of regulatory affairs, the head of data analytics, and so forth. Now, why is that? You know, it's not as though companies wake up and say, wow, I got a great idea. Let, let's be more bureaucratic. It is tied to the data revolution. The, you know, doing almost any function in a business these days, marketing, sales, supply chain, whatever, there's much more data. It takes much more effort and specialist expertise to stay on top of best practices. And that's what's driving that change in the C-suite. But the reality is the gap that you're referring to. The reality is that more and more senior teams in organizations are collections of specialists. And the reality is that fewer people than ever before have made it to the C-suite without prolonged prior experience in customer contact activities like marketing, sales, or service. And that is a very big deal, a very big deal, because one of the primary responsibilities of any senior leadership team is to put together and execute a market relevant strategy. And, you know, it's not just data, but you need experience with that in order to do it. So that's the gap. Now, how do we fix that? Let me tell you one way not to fix it, because this is what I see a number of organizations doing. We simply rotate a lot of people around. In other words, we try to make a great CIO into a, a good marketer or a salesperson. Bad idea. You wind up, you know, half turtle and half frog. I think you need a couple of things. One is you do need processes for getting the relevant information. But remember our earlier discussion, Keith, relevant information is not something that's going to be spouted out of a machine. Relevant information is the questions you ask because you know this is important in your business. Pablo Picasso, uh, late in life, did some work for IBM, and they actually gave him a, a demonstration of their IBM 360 computer. And Picasso allegedly said, computers are useless. They only give you answers. Do you see what he was getting at? That's yeah. So that's number one, relevant information and the processes for providing it. Number two, I think, is the ability of the people who do deal with customers. I'm going to call them salespeople. You know, I don't much care what jargon we use, but uh, those are the sorts of people I'm talking about. Their ability not only to do their job, but in turn, understand the bigger picture. And that's an issue in many organizations as uh, they get more siloed. Then beyond that, Keith, I'll get back to my original comment about business development. It is very, very context specific. So I think the things you do and don't do in software are going to be a lot different than in personal care products or, or other uh, categories. Yeah, it's wonderful thoughts. And I think 
kind of going to the team there, you know, a lot of times I think about the people that just rise to the top of an organization and they get a lot of accolades or they become, as you say in, in your writings, the stars. But sometimes, you know, the people in the organization that it's kind of fly under the radar or do a lot of the work. They have a lot of information and a lot of times they won't speak up. They sometimes hold that information themselves, but they do a lot of this work. And I often wonder how we get the information out of these people or how we get, we cross pollinate our teams. And I think of one example that I came across a BMW example, they were struggling with one of their processes and they, they ended up putting their salespeople with their engineers together and they ended up creating a better process to under because their engineers were having a hard time understanding why they couldn't sell some of their features. And their salespeople kept wondering why they kept putting on these new features that they just didn't understand where they were coming from. And they, they got this team together they, of their best salespeople and their best engineers. And it actually created one of their highest grossing vehicles. And I, I can't remember the, exactly which, which of their models it led to. But it, it was an amazing process where the you know the engineers and the salespeople often speak different jargons, different languages. And so when we can put them together to understand what people are looking for in a product, those buyers, as you mentioned, and also the engineers and why they're they're coming up with efficiencies. And even you know some of the stars spoke, but I wonder even in that model of BMW, who were some of those people that weren't necessarily the superstars that might have had some insight that were left out of that conversation? And how do we better even pull that information out of people in an organization to get, like you said, better questions to inform those computers. I'm not aware of the BMW example, but it's an interesting one. If you go back and read, and it's actually a wonderful book, uh, it's the autobiography of Alfred P. Sloan. Alfred P. Sloan was the man who took over a bankrupt General Motors in the 1920s And in less than a decade, he bankrupted Ford and turned uh, GM into, we forget this, one of the most profitable companies in the world for the next 50 years until GM itself kind of uh, dissolved. But uh, if you read his autobiography, it's called My Years at General Motors, that's exactly what Sloan did. He would make it a point of always trying to get the engineers and uh, the salespeople together for precisely the reason that you're mentioning in the BMW example. And he was doing this in the 20s, the 30s, the 40s. And I would add, by the way, that in many of our so-called tech firms, that same lesson has yet to be learned. You will find they're generally run by engineers. And, you know, they, they pride themselves on doing not what the customer wants, but our vision, our purpose, et cetera. Well, you know, good luck. I think there are also, however, two other dimensions uh, to the very good question that you're posing. One is about what happens as you rise in an organization, and the other is what does it mean to be a star, right? A star versus the others. I think what's built in to any hierarchy, whether it's a for-profit business organization or for that matter, a university, what's built in as you rise up is that you do tend to lose touch with what I'll call the field realities, right? How many deans or professors in schools of education, when's the last time they were in the classroom? That's the customer. And secondly, I think there's just the human uh, motivation to tell the guy or gal at the top what they want to hear, not necessarily what is going on. You know, at Harvard Business School, we write case studies. And I always remember one of the first case studies I wrote when I was a young professor. And what this executive said to me, it took me some time to understand the wisdom of what he was getting at. He said, Frank, what you're going to find is that in most companies, marketing and sales is conducted the way it should have been conducted five to 10 years in the past in that industry. Why? Because that's the last time the really important people in the organization, the senior leaders, were out in the field on a regular basis. So they tend to make decisions based on an obsolete view of what is really going on out there. So I think that's built in and leaders need to recognize that. If they take that for granted, if they don't get proactive about getting that information, they will be increasingly out of touch. I think that's the force field in organizations. 
Now, the other element is stardom. And here I'm going to use sales because I think it's a very representative and illustrative example. If you talk to people in companies, any company that's been around for any period of time, and by that I mean three to five years or more, they will almost always have had the experience of hiring someone who was clearly a bona fide star at organization wide, which is an organization in their industry. And they hire her, bring her to their organization, and somehow she doesn't perform the same way. Now, step back and think about that for a second. It's not as though that person suddenly got stupid and lost their individual abilities, right? That's not what's happened. What's happened is that performance, especially in business, there is no such thing as performance in the abstract. That is a platonic ideal that does not exist. There's only performance in our company, with our products, in our market, with our prices. And sales is a good example. It's not only your ability to get things done externally with prospects and customers, it's your ability to build the internal relationships required to do that. That takes time. Ultimately, you know, a sale is an organizational outcome. It is not simply the outcome of smart, persuasive salespeople. And one of the responsibilities of leadership, and here's where I think the phrase servant leadership applies exactly. One of the responsibilities of leadership is not to just bring someone in and say, all right, let's see how this works out. One of their responsibilities is to accelerate that necessary socialization process. So I think there are a number of things going on in the very good question you're asking, Keith. Uh, some wonderful insights there. And I, I'll start at the end. I just love that component you brought in of why people might not excel when they came from a different company when they were excelling. And there's some other things that happen when, when you do things like that too. And you can kill the momentum of a team when you change up the dynamics of it. And there's some inner office politics that happen in those things too. And some people lose their drive at the office when they feel like they might've deserved a chance to rise in the organization or some of those people that are the quiet workers in that organization, they might not resonate well with the same type of personalities as you alluded to there. And so that team might not gel together the same way. And that whole sales team is required to make the success of the quote unquote star, as you mentioned there. And I, I just love how you phrased that so well. And you know, that is it's such a powerful concept of servant leadership to talk about how that whole team works together and rises together to create that sale and also internally and externally to the organization. And I think about a lot of the things you write about in improving the return on investment in your training programs in relationship to that. And I, it's very relevant to me because I'm working on my doctorate in applied learning sciences. And I, I have this firm belief that so many of our training programs fall flat because they just are written to fill an organizational requirement and they're not really meant to elevate the level of knowledge of the individuals in our organizations. And so they, they're done to be the lowest cost or to be the quickest version of training. And so they're not always done with the, the learning sciences of creating knowledge transfer in mind. And I wonder if you have some thoughts on that or how we can think of even how the return on investment is part of the people aspect of that equation as well. Well, I mean, first, your intuition here is exactly right. The return on investment in training and in particular sales training is not good. I mean, studies consistently show that. The issue, however, is generally not that companies don't want to spend money on this. Companies already spend a ton of money on training and development. Uh, the issue, Keith, is a little bit like uh, public school education. The problem is not, do we spend money? The question is, how do we spend money? And uh, this is where I think your learning theory and uh, practice is very, very important. One of the major reasons, there are a number, but one of the major reasons why the ROI on training and development is so poor 
is that it's simply uh, most training and development initiatives ignore the realities of adult learning. They're based on what we know about high school or undergraduate education. But once people are in the workforce, it's a very different set of dynamics with adult learning. Salespeople are very, very representative. Salespeople are not studying for the final exam in my course or your course or the training seminar. Adults on the job tend to pay attention to information when and where they need that information, not weeks or months earlier or later at a training seminar. So what is the implication of that? The implication is the importance of just-in-time learning. In sales, they pay attention to the information on their way to make an important sales call or even during the sales conversation itself. And this is an area where technology supported by good learning processes can and should be your friend. There are now lots of technologies via the iPad, phones, etc., where you can get the relevant information to that person when and where they need it, not simply uh, through the seminar. The other element that's important here that's part of adult learning, and again, this is sales just happens to be a particularly illustrative example of this, but the importance of what the learning people call modeling behavior. And what they're getting at, and this is demonstrated in research about sales, how do people become better? Let's take sales as an example. Yes, they need the required knowledge. Yes, hiring is important. You know, we forget an obvious fact sometimes, and that is it's just tough to develop someone who's a bad fit for the job in the first place. So hiring and training uh, need to work hand in hand. But salespeople tend to learn the most by watching the best of their peers in action. You know, Keith, the way you dealt with that price objection, that I hadn't thought of that or the way you frame the value proposition. That was clever. I'm going to do that. And again, part of the role of leadership, and again, technology helps this, is to disseminate that best practice behavior sooner rather than later, faster rather than slower. And again, I'll use sales jargon. What you're doing is accelerating what in sales they call ramp up time the time required for someone to achieve productivity, but the same is true in other functions as well. So again, the issue is not lack of money. It's how that money is spent. And often it's spent in ignorance of or actually counter to what we know about adult learning as opposed to studying for the SATs. Awesome. Wonderful thoughts there. You know, I... I love how you put that in, you know, some of the things that we've learned about high school are not even effective in today's world and that That's we right. need to adapt. So if we're, if we're still using that mentality for adult learning, we're definitely failing just to throw in my two cents there. So in adult learning, and it's different too, depending on what you're talking about. And as you were talking about the needs of the salesperson, I was even thinking about, we might be talking about ways to do better sales, but we, what we might be needing to do training on is how to ask better questions and you know, that might be a roundabout way to increase our sales or do different things like that. And sometimes our focus areas might not seem so direct, but we can ask, do different things. And then we can show tangible examples of how that asking a better question can lead to the the information need that they need real time and show those examples and make it relative to them in the moment and that adult learning, and it can be a lot quicker and a lot more tangible. A lot of the, in my current research project right now, I'm focusing on social cultural learning. And there's a lot of ways to do that in a, in a sales environment where you even do what we're talking about and putting engineers and salespeople together to talk about how to ask better questions and use a real life example with some people. So I think there's a lot of, you know, real tangible examples that could become very real life for organizations and make that training not so theoretical, but really applied. And then it becomes a beneficial to the organization on multiple fronts. I agree. I think, and, and well said. And I think I want to leave the challenge for this episode with that thought is 
think about the training you're doing and really what the return on investment is. So what are you getting out of that training? What are the employees getting out of that training? Is it enhancing their ability to do their job? Is it making them better individuals in your organization? Is it setting them up for success in the organization or even after their life in the organization? Is that training really what it needs to do? And and then prepare yourself to ask better questions. What is the point of that training? And is the training filling the point that that training is designed for? Because if it's not, it's time to think about training in a new way. Because so many things in our world, the training is not meeting what it's designed for. And that's where we have to ask our training developers, our training designers, our curriculum designers to step up. They need to do a better job because the learning sciences are advancing rapidly and we can do better for our adult learners. So that's what I leave our challenge with for everyone today to think about, ask better questions about our learning. Now, Frank, I want to switch gears for a second. You said something early on the episode that has just been rattling around in my brain. As a strategist and an international person who thinks a lot about this, I recently had the opportunity to listen to, I think she's still just the nominated prospective chief of naval operations, Admiral Franchetti. Hopefully she becomes a CNO, but we'll see what Congress does with that. That's their purview. She referred to this decade with that we need consequential leadership in this decisive decade. And you said that we're situated nicely because of the way history is laid out and how the British before us, you know, we have these wonderful advantages. We're starting to see a little bit of a shift and we can change that where we can continue to allow ourselves to be situated nicely to allow the country to, to grow and do well in the United States and still be the center of the economic world and the learning world and to and not for control, but to allow ourselves to situate the world to be better servant leaders and to serve the world. And so I have two questions with kind of framing it in that way. One is, what advice would you have for leaders if something were to happen where we'd lose that advantage and we weren't, we, we didn't have that same advantage and we had to see the world in a different way? And then the second question is, what does it mean to take Admiral Franchetti's advice to step up and have consequential leadership in this decisive decade? Well, I mean, I guess I'd begin by extending the Admiral's comment. Uh, I think every decade has been a consequentialist decade. Every decade has its challenges and crises. And uh, I think, you know, we can easily point to so many that are bigger than this one, right? Would you rather be in the year 2023 or 1943 if you were an admiral in the Navy? So that that is just true. And, you know, what is also true is that you've, you've got to earn whatever advantage you have. You know, I always like to quote, uh, I'm going to get a little fancy with our listeners, but the great political theorist, Hannah Arendt, Hannah Arendt was once asked a similar question. She was asked, you know, do you think the barbarians are at the gate? And Hannah Arendt said the barbarians are at the gate every generation. They're called children. Children are not born knowing all the things we're talking about, about society, leadership, etc. They have to be socialized, acculturated, etc. So that is true. And no advantage it lasts forever. The advantage I was talking about is, is the advantage in having the English language, our language, because of historical circumstances. But generally, we don't have the advantage of the lowest cost labor in the world. Uh, we don't have the advantage that some other countries have about a monoculture as opposed to the glorious diverse cultures we have in the United States. So, you know, it's not as though this is there on a plate. Then what does that mean? My advice for leadership, A, you take it for granted, you're probably going to pay the price. That's uh, comment number one. And then comment number two, I guess, is there is no such thing as simply staying in place, at least in business. All right. That's never an option. And growth is very, very important. We tend to forget this in the last few years where we talk about lots of other things. But the reality is that growth is important in any organization. 
Promotion opportunities, pay are almost always directly correlated with growth. It's also important for society. And again, great research about this. Societies tend to be more tolerant. Societies tend to do a much better job with poverty when they're growing as opposed to when they're flat or even declining. So, you know, you can call that sales or you can call it something else. There's a social dimension to this as well as a profit maximizing dimension. Oh, I just love those comments. And, you know, all throughout this episode, I just want to really applaud and thank you, Frank, for so many times I've thrown some some questions at you and you just take such a well-balanced research approach. So your books, all of this stuff, you continue to take this level research-based approach and you always go back historically and you talk about these trend lines and it's just a wonderful way to show us not to get caught up in emotions, not to get caught up in what's happening right this moment. And I think it's a marvelous thing for us to do as servant leaders to think about what is the data showing us and how do we interpret this data? How do we ask better questions? How do we look at holistically our organizations about the competition around us in our organizations? What is our business model? What is our industry? And I just think Frank does a good job of modeling this. We could have asked so many different questions to go down the many different things that Frank answered. And this is the line we took. And I think that if you listen to this episode more than once, you can see there's a lot of different insights that you can pull from Frank's many different answers. And I highly recommend his books because this was just a sampling of the great insights that Frank has. Well, Frank, any final thoughts to close us up today? No, my one final thought, uh, Keith, flattery will get you everywhere with me. And I want to thank you very, very much for hosting me on the topic of leadership, because it is important. And, you know, if I can say so, it is important to make it more than a buzzword. Once it becomes a buzzword, its, its usefulness diminishes dramatically. Well, I agree. And that's what we're all about here on that all might be edified discussions on servant leadership. Take care of your people, find ways to edify them. Have a wonderful day. 